Welcome to KubeCon North America. Uh, today, Kong and David will be going through this migration from single node Kubernetes control plane to IHA production. Uh, over to you, David and Kong. For housekeeping, Q&A will be at the end, so please raise your hand and we'll come back to you. Thank you. at Databricks, and we're going to be talking about our experience migrating from a single node Kubernetes control plane to a highly available control plane uh, in production at Databricks. So uh, briefly, the outline of the talk is that first I'll talk about uh, how we use Kubernetes at Databricks, I'll talk about the non-HA control plane architecture that we used for many years. Uh, then I'll discuss the HA control plane architecture that we moved to and how it handles different kinds of failures. Um, then uh, Kong is going to talk about the migration process we used to move from the non-HA control plane to the HA control plane. And then we'll wrap up with uh, a discussion of some of the modifications we made to our day two processes to accommodate the HA control plane. So the, uh, as a brief overview of what Databricks is, the Databricks product is a SaaS data platform that runs on the public clouds. We call it the Databricks Lakehouse platform. And it's a unified platform that serves many uh, enterprise data use cases. Uh, such as data warehousing, data engineering, data science, uh, streaming, and uh, machine learning. Uh, the service operates at a very large scale. We have many thousands of customers, and the aggregate workload that we manage is very large. We launch uh, more than 10 million uh, VMs per day across Azure, AWS, and GCP, and our customers use the platform to process uh, many exabytes of data. So this slide shows the high-level architecture of the Databricks platform. Uh, it consists of a control plane that runs in Databricks-owned cloud accounts and a per-customer data plane that runs in the customer's cloud account. So uh, you can see in the left-hand box some of the services that constitute the Databricks control plane. These are multi-tenant services that run on Kubernetes clusters. And then the right-hand box shows the data plane for one customer uh, which consists of cloud storage and the compute that does all of the data processing. Uh, for historical reasons, uh, on GCP, the data plane runs on Kubernetes, but on AWS and Azure, it runs on VMs that are not managed by Kubernetes. Uh, but that's the data plane. This talk is about the control plane, uh, all of which runs on Kubernetes. Um, so the Databricks product gives customers the experience of a single unified system spanning the three clouds, but under the covers, the control plane is built from per-cloud region Kubernetes clusters. Um, Databricks is currently available in more than 60 regions across three clouds, and we have at least one Kubernetes cluster per region to host the Databricks control plane services. Now, uh, Databricks was a very early adopter of Kubernetes. The company adopted Kubernetes in 2015, which was before all three cloud providers had managed Kubernetes services. So we built our own tools to deploy and manage clusters directly on top of cloud provider VMs. We've recently also started using cloud provider managed uh, Kubernetes clusters for certain services, um, but this talk is about our self-managed Kubernetes clusters in these 60 regions, and uh, we're still uh, primarily using the, uh, the self-managed clusters, even though we're starting to adopt a cloud provider managed Kubernetes. Um, so this slide shows the non-HA cluster architecture that we had been using. Um, it's a very standard architecture that uh, most people who are running Kubernetes on the cloud are using, whether they're doing it self-managed or uh, using cloud provider Kubernetes. Uh, the control plane pods run on a single VM, and uh, we use cloud provider block storage for the etcd storage. Um, there's also a boot disk uh, that's, that's not shown here. Um, the only uh, part of this architecture that's uh, kind of maybe a little different than, than you normally see is that um, we have two separate IP addresses for the VM uh, and therefore for the API server. Um, there's a public IP and a private IP. Uh, the private IP for the API server is used uh, for the kubelets and uh, the workloads like the pods that are running on the worker nodes uh, to talk to the API server. And uh, the 
public IP is used by external clients like Cube Control and our CICD system uh, to talk to the API server. So the problem with this architecture is that if the control plane VM fails, then the workloads will continue running, but the cluster uh, essentially remains static. So like the cluster autoscaler can't scale nodes up and down because the cluster autoscaler uh, runs uh, uh, on the worker nodes but needs to talk to the control plane. Um, same thing with horizontal pod autoscaling. Uh, the horizontal pod autoscaler runs on the worker nodes and needs to talk to the control plane. So if the control plane's down, it can't do anything. Um, if, uh, if a pod fails or a node fails, the pod can't be rescheduled to another node. Um, and uh, if a pod fails or a node fails um, and it's part of a cluster IP service, then the, um, the endpoints won't be updated for any of the services that it's a member of. So um, this is not good, uh, and so the solution to that is to use an HA control plane, a high, highly available control plane, and the idea is to replicate the control plane VMs across multiple cloud zones so the control plane can continue functioning uh, when there is a VM or cloud provider zone failure. Um, this is a, it's kind of a picture of the architecture that uh, we use. It's similar to the approach used by Cubatom, COPS, and some other Kubernetes tools, except that we have uh, two load balancers. And I'm going to walk through each of the components here, uh, and then at, one, at some point we'll, we'll come to the load balancers, and I'll describe what we're, uh, what we're doing with those. So as I mentioned, the foundation of the HA control plane is three replicas of the single node control plane, so three VMs spread across three cloud zones uh, instead of just one VM in one zone. The three API servers run as a stateless load balance service where any replica can handle any API request, and they're all active at the same time. And each API server uh, replica reads and writes its local etcd replica, which uh, brings us to etcd. So there's three etcd replicas, one in each VM, uh, and these three etcd replicas form a cluster with one leader and two followers. And the reads and writes are always, are always served by the leader. So if an API server's local etcd is a follower and that API server tries to write to etcd, then that etcd replica will forward the write to the leader, which then commits it and then um, sends the acknowledgement back to the API server, uh, well, back to the etcd replica on the API server and then back to the API server. And same thing for reads. Um, uh, if uh, the API server is running on the node with uh, an etcd follower, then when the API server does a read, uh, that follower will forward the read to the leader and then uh, uh, forward the response back to the API server. This is to ensure uh, consistency uh, for, for reads. The scheduler and controller manager in this architecture are master elected, so all of the replicas are always running, but only one is doing work at any given time. So this is a little different from how the API server worked. If you remember, I mentioned with the API server, um, all three replicas are always able to handle requests. They're essentially like identical to one another in their behavior, um, whereas the scheduler and controller manager, um, only one is actively doing work at any given time. And there's a lease mechanism that allows one of the standby schedulers or controller managers to take over uh, if the active leaseholder fails. And then uh, lastly, uh, we replace the public and private IP interfaces from the single control plane VM uh, in that non-HA setup that I showed you at the beginning with public and internal multi-zone load balancers. Um, but the philosophy is still the same. Uh, the worker node kubelets and the services running on the worker nodes talk to the API server through the internal load balancer and external clients like the CICD system or an engineer using cube control talk to the API server through the public IP. So the main failure modes that this architecture addresses is a single VM failing or a single cloud zone failing. So let's talk about what happens uh, in, in those scenarios. So the load balancers will notice that the VM has become unreachable and will stop routing requests to that API server but they'll continue to route requests to the API servers in the zones that are still up. So those are the green arrows showing the load balancers routing requests to the VMs or zones that are, that are still, still up. Um, if the active scheduler was in 
the failed zone, then one of the other two schedulers will become the active scheduler. And same thing with the controller manager. If the active controller manager was in the failed zone or on the failed VM, then one of the other two controller managers will become the active controller manager. And then lastly, if the etcd leader was in the failed zone, then one of the other two etcd replicas will become the leader. And so this setup brings the theoretical availability of the control plane from two and a half nines with a single VM control plane. That's like the typical uh, VM SLA from a cloud provider, two and a half nines, um, to four nines with this uh, HA control plane. So unfortunately, although the system can tolerate one VM failure or one cloud zone failure, it can't tolerate two simultaneous zone or VM failures because the etcd cluster requires a quorum of two healthy replicas. So uh, if you have uh, two simultaneous failures, the clients can still reach the API server in the one healthy zone at the network level because the load balancers will forward the requests to that one uh, remaining uh, node. Um, but that API server won't respond to read or write requests because etcd won't process the requests because of the lack of a quorum. Um, now, you could tolerate two simultaneous failures by running five control plane replicas instead of three, but cloud providers generally don't have five zones in each region, so that wouldn't help tolerate multiple zone failures, and so we decided it really wasn't worth the, the cost that, that, uh, to, to have five, five replicas. And uh, the last component that we haven't covered are the load balancers, so if the, and what happens if they fail. So if the public load balancer fails, then external clients won't be able to connect to the API servers. Uh, so for example, a client can't create new workloads or roll out a new version of a workload or anything else that external clients typically do uh, when they talk to the API server. But already running workloads will continue to run, and all the dynamic behaviors that I talked about earlier, like pod rescheduling and auto-scaling, those will all continue to work. And if the internal load balancer fails, then the opposite is true. Uh, in that case, external clients can still do operations on the API server, like creating and updating workloads, but the API server will stop seeing the heartbeats from the nodes. There's like no communication. The communication with the nodes is, is cut off. Um, and the node controller actually won't evict pods in this scenario. There's like a special case in the node controller where if it sees all the nodes die at the same time, it won't try to uh, move pods around. Uh, but uh, so, so the, the workloads will continue to run even though uh, the nodes have stopped heartbeating, but the dynamic behaviors like pod rescheduling uh, and auto-scaling won't happen. And then lastly, if the entire cloud region fails, then the HA control plane architecture can't help because the control plane VMs all run in a single region. In theory, you can run the same architecture where you spread the three control plane nodes across regions and use like a, a multi-region cloud load balancer um, and then tolerate region failure. But uh, because our control planes are per region, uh, we set this up uh, as replicated within a region instead of across regions. So now that I've described the HA control plane architecture, uh, Kong is going to talk about how we migrated our production servers from the single node architecture to the HA architecture, all while the clusters continued to serve user traffic. Thanks, David. So in the context of migration, we know the non-HA control plane. So it has the uh, cluster state stored in the ICD, and then it had two interface as the two IPs for the single uh, control plane VM to serve the, uh, the, uh, the API to access the, the mutated class state. And then we want to change the architecture from non-HA to HA. The cluster state need to be still the original class state in the non-HA, and then the uh, interface to access uh, uh, the control plane should not be changed. So basically, we want to migrate the control plane and for the workload, as David mentioned, during the whole migration, we want the workload still keep up, keep up and running. We don't want that workload get affected. In our case, we have a production cluster across 60 regions. So basically, the required level requirements is to migrate the control plane without affecting the production workloads. So we defined the requirements as follows. So all workloads should keep on running during migration and no client reconfiguration. Also, the, micro, the migration uh, across the fleet should be automated, and this should support both roll forward and roll back. 
With this high-level requirement, before I share how we designed our migration process, I want to step back a little bit to think about what are the most important things when we do the uh, migration, what we want to protect uh, with the first priority, and the, what we are migrating. So from the architecture we discussed before, we can see in a Kubernetes control plane, it has a cluster state in the ICD. And so from one HA to HA, basically it's a move from one ICD node to three ICD column. And also the class state served by API server, the interface doesn't change. Basically change from IP to IPs to two load balancers. And then the class state will keep mutating as far as like the control plane server metric. For example, the controller manager can mutate the class state during the reconciling the resources. Also, Kubelet from worker can report the node status so that the uh, class state for the node will be mutated. Meanwhile, the pods, the workload, can also talk to API server, like those operator can change the class state as well. So we can see, actually, during the migration, we have control plan, we have workers, and then we have workload. So basically, we want to protect the workloads, so that means the class state needs to be safe. We want to migrate that to BHA, but we don't want to break the workload. So with this keeping in mind, we designed our migration into three phases. And then for each phase, actually, to include multiple steps. And I want to echo back a little bit, uh, you know, what things we want to protect most again. So basically, we want to protect workload. That means during the multiple step migration process, any single step can fail. Even that fail, we want that the workload still be protected, and that it fail just roll back or fix that and move forward and do the migration again. So then here we designed the three phases. The first phase basically to get the cluster state from the non HA control plan, in particular is in the ICD. Meanwhile, because we want to protect the workloads, we will shut down all the traffic to the control plan. This is similar as like uh, the downtime when we have non HA control plan. Then next step, we want to migrate the cluster state to the HA control plan. So basically, like uh, to, to uh, we, we will cover the details. So high level ideas basically replicate one ICD to three, and then somehow make it work for the HA control plan. So here is it's follow the same principle as the phase one. It's multiple steps. Any single step can fail. We want to protect workloads. So basically, we will shut down the traffic to the control plane to make sure the class state will not get mutated, so it's consistent. Workload just keep on running. It's degraded a little bit. As David mentioned, the, the horizontal scaling and the vertical scaling cannot work, but uh, the workload still keep on running. And the last phase, when we confirm everything works fine, then we will reopen the traffic. This means like a traffic from the public interface, so the CI, CD can do the deployment, as well as the internal interface, uh, like the Kubelet can report no status, Kube controller manager can start to reconcile resources. So after the last phase, we will have a HA control plan with fully up and running. So now let's talk about each phase. As the first phase, based on high level idea, we want to get the cluster state from non-HA in a safe way. So uh, in the non-HA uh, control plan, basically this is uh, you know, a diagram in a single VM, it has ICD as a, a couple control plan uh, components. The first thing before actually we get to the state, we want to make sure the state is st static at that point. So the first step is we mute, we shut down all the control plan pods. And then, that, so from the second step for the first phase, basically we want to build a snapshot, the input we can use for the second phase because at this moment, workloads will not get affected, but uh, just get degraded in terms of the dynamic change. So here we use one ICD utility tool to take snapshot from ICD data folder. While we use the ICD control here, basically for ICD, actually it has two types of information. One is the data, the other actually is the core member information. When we change from non-HA ICD to HA ICD, the data is the one we want to keep, but the core member information we want to, you know, to change that from one node to uh, multiple nodes. And the next step is we shut down the, uh, the single node control plane to release IPs. As we mentioned, basically ICD, the cluster state in the ICD definitely is the one we want to keep and then reuse it for the HA control plane. Also the two interface, the IPs, we will reuse that for the load balancers. 
So what the snapshot file we use for the uh, ICD control is in the ICD desk. And then we just use, and the last step is we use the cloud snap to basically to take a snapshot so that when we create a new disk for the HA control plane, we can just create the uh, data disk from the snapshot. So with this, now we get everything prepared to be reused for the HA control plane. We can see actually this is a multiple step process and every step it can fail. It can fail due to some implementation bug, it can fail due to you know, transition to cloud provider failure and so on. Thank you. As the second phase, now we have the input as a class state from the non-HA control plan. Also, we have the IPs release so that we can use. At this moment, the workload is still keep up and running, but just get degraded. So the second phase is to basically to bootstrap the HA control plan. But I want to emphasize again, basically we will not start the traffic. The high level idea is to keep the class state to be consistent for the whole pro migration process because it will take you know, from 10 minutes to 30 minutes and every single step can fail. So the first step is to build the three control plan VM and then the data disk is from the snapshot we took before from the you know, non-HA control plan. And then the second step for in this phase is to build you know, the two low balancer and then the IP from the, for the two low balancers is the original IP from the non-HA uh, single node control plane. But at this moment, we don't want to serve the, serve the traffic. So th that we create a low balancer, but we don't uh, open the traffic to access the API server. As a last step, now we have the, all the cloud resources re uh, deployed. But the actual ICD, as I mentioned before, there are two sides for the ICD. One is the data, the other is the coral. The data is there, but uh, even we use the snapshot to create new ICD disk, the coral cannot be built yet. So we use the, the uh, tool called ICD control, restore. So the, basically we statically rebuild the new coral with, for the three nodes. Till here, now actually we do have a HA, HA control plan, keep up running. But one thing is, uh, because we didn't re uh, restart the, the Kube controller manager, and then we didn't open the, the traffic from the two low balancer, so basically the workload, the worker side, can still not talk to the, the control plane yet. But the control plane itself is isolated up and running. So as the last phase, we will just reopen the traffic because we confirmed the, the HA control plane is uh, bring up as we expected. So during the whole migration process, we can see in each phase it has multiple steps, and the principle for each phase basically is to, to correctly get the snapshot, and then to protect the workloads by you know only when we are ready to make sure the whole control plane is, is up and running, and then we reopen the, the traffic so that this actually make the rollback much easier. So before phase three, we can just roll back you know by redeploy the non-HA cloud resources, the IC disk as it says. Cloud of state is not you know, muted at all. And after phase three, let's say you know, we uh, migrate to HA control plane after say a couple of days, the cloud state will, keep, will be mutated. In that case, we'll follow the same principle to get the cloud state from the HA control plane and then do a snapshot. And then from that snapshot, rebuild a new IC disk for the non HA control plane and then you know, build a single node ICD coral. So basically, the same, the same principle will be applied for both rollback and roll forward. So lastly, actually, I want to share one lesson we learned from one of the outage uh, we, uh, caused by one inconsistent class state during the migration. So as I explained uh, in the previous migration uh, process, we can see uh, to protect a class state is the most important thing for the whole migration process especially keep being the class state consistent. In the phase three, uh, we mentioned actually we just op uh, restart the Kube controller manager and then reopen the traffic. But, uh, actually during the
watching the game. <laughs> yeah. So in, in the last phase of mi migration, uh, we had one bug in the code. So when we basically uh, try to restart the Kube Controller Manager and uh, reopen the load balancer traffic at the same time. But uh, for some reason, the, it took much longer than we expected to reopen the uh, load, ba load balancer traffic. So that there, is one, there was one state, Kube Controller Manager is up and running, but uh, the load balancer is still closed. Then what will happen? So basically, Kube Controller Manager can talk to API server to start reconcile resources. But uh, for workers, they cannot, they use uh, the load balancer, the couplets using the load balancer to talk to control plan API server to report its node status. So Kube Controller Manager think, oh, actually some nodes is not healthy because it hasn't reported status for a while. So the service controller inside the Kube Controller Manager start get kicked in and then start to remove some of the nodes from the load balancer for the services. Actually, if we keep, we, we got alerted immediately, if we keep this state longer, it will, like, you know, the, some nodes will even get removed from the cluster. This is one lesson we learned that the keep the cluster state consistent is really important for the migration, whole migration process. So because the migration process, you know, it's, uh, when we do the migration across uh, different regions, the behavior and the cloud provides transit failure could cause outage like this. So from the lessons, we can see actually it's really important to protect the class state to be consistent during the whole process. So finally, if I use one sentence to summarize migration, I would say HA control plan migration is really about the class state migration and keeping the class state consistent is critical to make sure workloads not get affected. So now let me hand back to David, talk about our day two after migration to HA control plan. Thanks, Kong. Um, so the last topic we're going to uh, cover before we wrap up is how we adapted uh, some of our day two processes for the HA control plane. So one process that we modified was how we upgrade the control plane to new Kubernetes versions. Um, so previously, the first step of this process was that we'd run a set of cluster level precondition checks, like verifying that all the API objects in the API server are compatible with the new Kubernetes version, um, and checking to make sure the control plane is at the same Kubernetes version as the worker nodes. Um, so for the HA control plane, we extended the control plane version check to make sure all of the control plane nodes are at the same Kubernetes version as each other before we start the upgrade, because it would be bad if they start off uh, in, in different versions. So if the cluster level precondition checks pass, then we start the upgrade of the first control plane node. Um, we run some precondition checks, like making sure all three control plane nodes are up. This is important because uh, one of the benefits of the HA control plane architecture is that you can take down one of the nodes uh, for a Kubernetes version upgrade and still continue to serve user traffic because you only need two of the nodes to be up um, in order to serve the, the users. Um, but uh, if uh, you don't start off with all three control plane nodes up, uh, then when you take one down, then you, you, you lose that uh, because then there will be zero or one nodes up. So in order to prevent users from experiencing downtime, we make sure all three are up before we do uh, a version upgrade on one of them. So then we uh, shut down the uh, VM that we're going to upgrade. Uh, we create a new VM at the new, uh, with the new Kubernetes uh, control plane version um, and deploy everything on it. And then lastly, we run some validation tests to make sure that the upgrade was successful. Um, we already had some validation tests we were running when we had the single node control plane architecture. Um, and the one we added for the HA control plane is ensuring that uh, traffic is going through all three API servers successfully and approximately balanced uh, evenly. Um, and if any of the validation tests fail, then we automatically roll back the upgrade. Um, but assuming they pass, then we repeat the same process for the second control plane node in the cluster, and then finally for the third control plane node. And then if the validation tests pass there, uh, we move on to the next cluster and repeat the same process, upgrading uh, one node at a time and running the precondition checks and the validation tests after uh, each, uh, each node, and then um, so on through all of the clusters in the fleet. The second day two process that we modified uh, when we moved to the HA control plane was how we measured and monitored API server availability. 
Um, the reason why quantifying API server availability is a little more complicated with the HA control plane than with a single node control plane is that with the HA control plane, if one API server is down, then there's no user visible impact. So the first approach we considered is shown on this slide. And the idea was to use the success rate of actual API requests to compute availability. So we have a Prometheus agent running in the cluster that talks directly to the API servers and scrapes the API server request total Prometheus metric uh, from the API server's metrics endpoint. Um, this uh, API server request total metric, for those who aren't familiar with it, it records the total number of API requests received by or processed by the API server, broken down by various categories, including the HTTP response code, uh, so we can know which requests are successful and which return errors. And then we compute the availability as the number of requests that return a successful HTTP response code across all API servers, divided by the total number of requests processed by all the API servers. Um, so the downside of this approach is that if two API servers are down or the load balancer is down, then this metric will give you a non-zero availability, um, even though the end user is uh, going to see uh, zero uh, availability because the cluster isn't accessible um, when, when uh, two or more of the API servers are down or the load balancer is down. So the second approach we considered was to have the Prometheus agent periodically just probe the API server's metrics endpoints to see whether the API servers are alive. And then we defined availability as the number of times this probe gets a response divided by the total number of probes. And the probing is done through the load balancer, so it reflects the user visible downtime. Um, but this approach has a downside of uh, not reflecting the internal API server errors like the first approach did. So the approach we ultimately chose is a combination of the two. Uh, we used the same fraction from the first approach, which was the total number of successful API requests divided by the total number of API requests processed. But we also do the probing that I described in the second approach. Uh, and we multiply the fraction from the first approach um, by zero if the probing approach shows that the user is not getting a response um, because two or more API servers are down or the load balancer is down. And so this way, we end up with an availability number that reflects uh, API server errors and also scenarios where the API servers are down from the user perspective. Um, so to wrap up, I'll just briefly summarize how the various aspects of our overall design allowed us to meet the requirements that Kong mentioned earlier. So uh, we had the requirement that uh, all the workloads running on the cluster must continue to run during migration. And uh, the way we accomplished that was to snapshot the single node etcd and clone the disk to create the two new replicas so that the cluster state after the migration was exactly the same as the cluster state before the migration. We had the requirement that there should be no requirement for client reconfiguration. We didn't want to have to change any of the configuration of the kubelets or the workloads or uh, external clients that are talking to the API server. And so to accomplish that, we reused the same um, IP addresses from the VM in the single node control plane architecture as the load balancer IP addresses. So the internal and external VM IP addresses became the uh, internal and external load balancer IP addresses. And then, um, uh, we had the third requirement that the per cluster migration and rollback should be automated and safe. Uh, so we accomplished that by having a migration script that automatically rolls back upon failure, um, by not making any state mutations until the HA control plane is up and running. Um, Kong talked a lot about that so that we could do safe rollback and uh, ensuring that the kubelets have heartbeated before the controller manager is re-enabled. So uh, the controller manager doesn't come up after this, uh, like Kong mentioned, 10 to 30 minute process, see that the nodes haven't heartbeated, and then try to remove them as load balancer backends or do, do something else and consider them down. And then uh, lastly, we have the requirement that the migration across the fleet should be automated and safe. So to accomplish that, we used a pipeline for migration and uh, check these preconditions and postconditions for each cluster before moving on uh, to, to the next cluster. Um, and uh, I'll skip this since we're running low on time. Uh, this is just summarizing the availability metric that we talked about a minute ago and the additional benefit of the HA control plane. It doesn't just give you high availability. It also lets you tolerate, um, uh, sorry, it also lets you continue to serve user traffic unaffected um, during a Kubernetes control plane version update because you can tolerate one node being down at a time. <laughs> 
So thanks, uh, we appreci I appreciate your attention, um, and uh, we're happy to take questions in the few minutes uh, that are left. Thanks, David and Kong. Uh, if, <laughs> we are on time, so if you have questions, you can come and you can ask. Yep. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, I have two questions. So did you have to over-provision your clusters um, to account for the 10 to 13 minutes that you guys were migrating and it, they were statically stable? Um, so that, you know, if, if, more, if more sort of traffic comes in, you, you can handle that load. The second one was, did you change the instance types as you move from single node to uh, an HA cluster? Yeah, for your first question, actually before the migration, our cluster already have the, head, the headroom pause because we are using cluster or scalar for the, in, if, uh, even d during the non-HA control plane architecture. So, so we didn't do specially f to uh, add new nodes when we migrate from non-HA to HA. But because the process actually usually take about 10 minutes when we automate that. The outage I mentioned actually that's one case uh, because like uh, the Kube controller manager get, key, get kick in. So, Sorry, what's your second question? Uh, you, you oh, like yeah. So for control plan, basically, uh, it's a CPU spike. And then for the non-HA control plan, actually, it's a more CPU spike than the HA control plan. So well, as the first phase, we didn't change the uh, instance type. And then now, because the HA control plan has been rolled out for all production uh, clusters, we are looking at tuning the instance actually to get it down a little bit. We'll take our last question. Thank, thank you both for uh, sharing the information. You mentioned uh, reusing IP address both for the public side and the private side, and um, there are load balancers that, that have you put three IP addresses instead of one. How did you manage those scenarios where the load balancer would require an IP address per zone, uh, which means it's not one, it's three? Uh, how, how did you cover for such situation? Did you have such situation? And if you did, how did you cover for such situation? Yeah, I think it's a slightly different from each cloud provider in terms of uh, whether a load balancer can, should have multiple IP in a single zone or across, uh, is it just single IP across different zone? For AWS and Azure, it's a single IP, and then you can deploy a load balancer across different zones. For AWS, it uh, requires a different IP in different zone. But uh, for the LB, it's a little bit implementation detail. It has a zone known DS and a regional DS. For us, because the, uh, to, mag to migrate from non-HA to HA, it cross zone is uh, the actual benefit. So we use the zone known DS to first. So for the two actual uh, IP, we are not using it yet. But after we fully migrate HA, we are using it. Yeah, thanks. And if you have other questions, feel free to come up and ask us.